Hi, John Valvano here. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to introduce the concept of Lab 6, which will send us on a journey for which we will build embedded systems. So Lab 6 is just a practice design, okay? just to show you the steps for creating an embedded system. Okay? All right. We are going to design something in particular, and what we're going to design here in Lab 6 is either an alarm clock okay, or a music player. And you're going to go, hey, John, I've seen that before. Uh, that was Lab 3 or Lab 5. Uh, but that's okay. What we're going to do here in Lab 6 is we're going to take one of those two, your choice, either Lab 6 or Lab 5, and you're going to go through the design cycle, design process of creating an embedded system based on either of those two systems. And so uh, we're going to traverse the design cycle, although, as you can see, we've actually already done most of the steps of creating either an alarm clock or a music player. Okay? And so the problem uh, has been given to us, and that was the assignment Lab 3 or Lab 5. Uh, we uh, had high-level data flow graphs and call graphs. That was, again, all part of Labs 3 or 5 and you did a prototype uh, using the launch pad to build up either the clock or the music player. Uh, and what we're going to do now is we're going to go through this design cycle and produce, at least on paper, a printed circuit board, and we're going to put it in a box. Okay? And so that will be the two changes, the two additional steps that we're going to do here in Lab 6 that we hadn't done back when we did either Lab 3 or Lab 5, and that is to design a printed circuit board, which we won't actually produce. We're just going to create a piece of paper, and we're going to put it in a box, which we're actually not going to buy. We're just going to borrow the box. Okay? All right, so that's the essence here of Lab 6, and that is to take something we've already built and then embed it in a box. All right. If we were to take our lab uh, <clears throat> and go all the way to the solution, it would end up uh, as a printed circuit board, and that printed circuit board would go in a box, and it would have battery power. Okay. So uh, we're going to, in Lab 6, our requirements document is exactly the same as it was for Lab uh, 3 or 5, and that is tell exactly what the system does, uh, and it's an agreement between you and your customers, in this case the teaching assistant. Uh, it can actually be a legal binding contract. So again, we're going to see this requirements document over and over again this semester. Uh, as we said before, it has to be easy to read, it has to be easy to understand, it has to be unambiguous, totally clear, complete, verifiable, and then more interesting is modifiable. So when we come up with a roadblock, we're not going to beat our heads up against the wall. We're going to redefine the problem uh, so that we can solve it. Okay? But it doesn't say how it's going to work. That's your job as engineer to make it work. Uh, and this was the day, this was, these are the components of the requirements document. Uh, you're going to have to do one of these for Lab 7, uh, but in Lab 6, uh, what we're going to do is just copy the exact same one we had for Lab 3 or 5. Uh, and like I said, we're going to add the fact that we're going to produce a printed circuit board, and we're going to put it in a box and add a battery. Okay? Uh, the printed circuit board we're going to make in Lab 6 is just a piece of paper. But the requirements document is what we're going to copy from our Lab 3 or Lab 5 in terms of what it does, how it works, and how we're going to test it. All right. Uh, this is uh, a screenshot of what the uh, PCB looks like in PCB Artist. And next time uh, we're going to go through the details of PCB Artist, and so you get to play with it. Uh, and but suffice it to say, where, wherever there's a wire, okay, wherever there's a wire, we're going to lay, lay a trace, and that trace is either going to be on the top, or that trace is going to be on the bottom. And when we want to put down the processor, our microcontroller is going to go here, and so uh, the system for Lab Six 
and then when you do it again in lab seven, it will not have a launch pad. It will have the microcontroller uh, embedded on the PCB. And this shows you, uh, again, what it looks like. Some of these holes are for mounting the, um, the board, and some of these holes are going to be mounting for the liquid crystal display. Again, we're going to build a paper design that fits in a box. And on it, we're going to implement the solution to our lab three or lab five. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start with our lab three or lab five. We're going to start with the SCH uh, file. Okay. And we're going to convert it over. So rather than using a launch pad, we're going to use a specific single chip. Uh, the exact same one, by the way, the TM4C123. Uh, all of the components that you had in labs three and five are going to be uh, soldered onto this one uh, paper PCB uh, on this single board, rather than having a bunch of wires everywhere. And we're going to embed all of that on the, uh, on the printed circuit board. We require that you hand place and hand route, because it turns out placing and routing are the fun parts. And uh, you will learn when we have a, a visitor coming in in a couple of weeks who does this for a living, you will learn that even the professionals don't use auto place or auto route. There's an art associated with what we're going to do here in lab three and seven. We'll let you, lab six and seven, we'll let you play with that. Uh, it has to fit in a box. I don't care how big the box is. There'll be choices, little boxes, big boxes, huge boxes. I don't care. Uh, it will be battery powered. Okay, and uh, you're going, you've already measured how much current it took to do lab three and how much current it took to do lab five. So you already know uh, how big a battery you're going to need in order for it to run 24 hours. Okay, and that battery is also in the box. Again, you're not going to buy the battery here in lab six. You're just going to pretend to have it. All right. Now, if you're going to do lab three, uh, you're probably going to run off a 3.7 volt lithium ion battery. Again, you don't have to buy it, but you're going to pretend to buy it. And then we're going to use a low voltage drop regulator. Uh, we'll see that next time that low voltage drop regulator is probably the LP2950. Uh, okay? And that is going to create a 3.3 volt uh, power supply for, from that battery. And so again, you're going to calculate uh, how long it will run. Uh, so you will look at the battery. Let's say your, your system uh, requires 40 milliamps to run, right, at three volts. Uh, we are going to be interested in buying a battery, right, which is in rated in amp hours. Okay, so the, the, the rating of the battery is in amp hours. Uh, we're going to divide that by, um, it has to run for 24 hours. And the battery has to be bigger uh, than uh, whatever the rating is of the battery divided by 24 hours has to be bigger than 40 milliamps. And that's the power budget that we're going to require you to do in lab six. And that'll tell you uh, how big a battery you have to buy. In other words, how big a battery you have to put in the box that you're going to create here in Lab 6. Uh, lab 5 is a, um, uh, doing Lab 5 for Lab 6 is a little bit different because uh, if I were doing my Lab 5, I would probably run off a 4.8 volt uh, nickel metal hydride. Uh, that gives me more voltage for my speaker so it can be louder. Uh, it turns out you could use a 3.7 volt lithium ion for this one as well. Uh, and so what you're going to do is power the, uh, the audio amp uh, from the 4.7 volt uh, nickel metal hydride or the 3.7 volt lithium ion. Now you have to be careful that you don't burn up the chip. It turns out this TPA um, 731 cannot be powered with 7.4 volts. Uh, and so if you're using a TPA 731, you have to use either 3.7 or 4.8 volts. And again, you're going to do the same sort of thing. Uh, let's assume that your, uh, your, your music takes uh, 80 milliamps to run. Okay, again, at 3.3 volts. 
And so you're going to have to choose a battery, a battery uh, uh, energy level in, again, it's rated in amp hours, uh, divided by the 24 hour uh, specification. And this uh, inequality has to be true in order to satisfy the lab six requirement. Okay, that the energy of the of the battery divided by the lifetime has to be less. Um, well, this one has to be bigger than the average current um, that your system needs. Uh, we make you build a part. Uh, there'll be a demonstration of this later, but uh, basically uh, we'll have some parts for you to add to the library because often we, uh, we're not there. And so there will be um, uh, three parts to creating a part. First is what does it look like? you know in the what does it look like uh in the uh, in the schematic in other words what are its inputs what are its outputs what are its pin numbers how is it powered okay um Generally, we like to put the power, the power input on the top, we put the ground connection on the bottom, we put the inputs on the left, and we put the outputs on the right. That's a typical uh, language for circuit diagram building. Uh, so we, we will draw what it looks like. Now, what I do is I look and see what's already there, and I copy one that's close to the one that's there and just edit it. Okay? The second is we define what it looks like on the PCB. And so if it's, uh, if it's a uh, through hole part, it'll look like this. You know, pins one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, it will specify how far apart are the pins here, how far apart are the pins there, how big are the holes, et cetera. Okay? Um, and show you what it looks like when we put it on the printed circuit board. If it's a surface mount part, uh, um, again, we're going to probably edit, regardless of whether it's a, if it's a through hole dip part or a surface mount part, we probably can just copy an existing part and just rename it, renumber it, etc. So I'll let you look at the existing footprints uh, to make sure um, uh, that it all is the right size. Okay? And the way we're going to test if it works, we're actually going to print it out, put our piece on top of it and see if it fits. Uh, the piece of paper, same size, we can tell. And then last component is we're going to connect uh, the view that's in the SCH, the schematic, to the view that we have in the PCB. And we're going to connect pin one to pin one, pin two to pin two, pin three to pin three, in such a way that uh, whatever the inputs and outputs are, uh, they are mapped to the proper pins on the device. And that's what we're going to do to create a component. So uh, take an easy one, get your TA to give you an easy one. No problem. All right. Uh, if your system actually uses it, you can leave it. If it doesn't use it, you'll temporarily add it and uh, try it out um, and add the part to your printed circuit board. Okay? And when you do that, you have to update the components uh, so that it uses the new language and um, you have to do the forward design change so it ends up from the SEH onto the PCB. So in summary, the objective of Lab 6 is to create a piece of paper here that is a mock-up or a pretend printed circuit board for solving either lab 3 or lab 5 such that this piece of paper will fit into this box. So next time we're going to talk about how to use PCB Artist and lay it out and what are all the rules and how to put all the pieces together. Uh, so again lab 6 is a practice design and then when we get to lab 7 you'll get to go through the full thing all over again.